We are on Twitch. We are live. So if you want, you can come join us, but you'll probably miss it. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, if you do happen to go live and you do miss it right here above us, this channel right here, this is where you can catch all the highlights and things of that nature. We also got the Patreon. Um, yo, I did a Misfits today. And I do not know where it is. I cannot find it. Like, I'm not, if we, like, we just gonna have to miss that episode then, because I'm not watching it twice. It don't even feel the same when you watch it twice, you get me? Um, anyway, yeah, we also got, um, the Discord as well, man. But let's get into this. This is, uh, a crazy title. Uh, Prostitutes of London. How Controlling Prostitution and Sex Trafficking Works. Hey, YouTube, this is, I don't condone this. I'm just here to watch. I'm here to learn. This is not, these are not the views of the lit one. I'm here for educational purposes. She would get 30% or you would get 30%. I think this is by taboo room, yeah. I would get 30%. She would get 70 But she has to provide her own accommodation. She would have to pay for her own photography. And I'm simply just passing on the booking, and for that, 30%. If there was actually more involved, for example, if I was providing our accommodation, jump up to 50%. Mm. Yeah, it so how did you get into... So basically, they be having them in 360 deals. That's crazy. Running an escort agency? Well, the story starts... I had arranged two or three bookings for my friends with a existing London escort agency. They came quite friendly with the operator. And, you know, just as a joke, he said, well, actually, the three bookings you arranged, you could have earned X amount of money in commission. And that got me thinking. What got me thinking is, how hard could this be? You know, if I have already the business and the marketing skills, I could actually do it better than him and better than a lot of the competition are there. So what was the first steps to so, setting up the agency? So he a pimp with a degree. A pimp with GCEs, GSEs, or whatever y'all call them. Needing some basic web design skills, um, some search engine optimization. Um, back then, so I started in 2008. Um, hey. the algorithms for Google were very different. We're talking a lot of backlinks, you know, a lot of um, links from review websites, advertising websites. But then the biggest challenge is, how do you find the girls? And how did you find the girls? Good question. Okay. The girls registered on London agencies that are across multiple agencies. They're not really going to take off anyone new. So let's look at some independents. You know, can, can I do something better for them? Are they getting enough work? You know, at the end of the day, if I provide the work, they will come and join. Word will spread, they will tell their friends, their friends will join. And therefore, the business will grow, the agency will grow. So, so he came into pimping as a, as a whole business, business exec. It's tough. And his eyes is crooked. So who was the first girl you hired? And how did that happen? I was testing the waters and put a few advertisements out there and received a call from a girl from Israel. Said she was coming to London. Picked her up from the airport. And then, yeah, she was actually my first ever girl. So randomly, you put an ad up and a lady from Israel said she's up for working for you. Yeah, it really surprised me, but it just seemed that I had a knack for it. I just knew where to target, where to find potential escorts and where to find potential customers. Uh and like, just for me, like looking like, not looking like a sleaze ball also helps out, right? You know what I'm saying? Especially in this world, you gotta remember where I'm from. West side of Chicago is full of pimps. So South side too, North side, all of Chicago is it's a it's a full of pimps. So, and with her being your first client, so what would be the split like? How much would you charge, and how often would she have to work? Thirty. I'm talking about first client. Okay. Percent for work as and when she wanted. She would get 30% or you would get 30%? I would get 30%. She would get 70 But she has to provide her own accommodation. 
she would have to pay for her own photography. And I'm simply just passing on the booking. And for that 30%, Dang. if there was actually more involved, for example, if I was providing that accommodation, jump up to 50%. So there'd be times where you would take people on and the split would just adjust accordingly based on what you offer them? Yeah, so 50% if I'm providing gold accommodation, and this is usually in the case of someone working part-time, because they would use one place to live and one place to work. Our most escorts here actually work and live from their apartment. Um, how do they feel, I guess, giving you 30 and 50% if they're selling their body and, and doing the work? Well, as I mentioned, um, how I recruited initially, or my idea to recruit initially was target independence. Now, independence will be cleaving 100%. But then why would they work for me? Because I can find them the punter where they couldn't. They didn't have that set of skills to get the punter to call in the first place. And that's why they paid the commission. This is crazy. The way he's just framing it is like he's a broker. He's a, he's a, a middleman for this. <laughs> and then I guess, how did it snowball? How did the agency start to grow? And how did you start getting more and more girls? At the time, I we went to partnership with actually the first escort agency that we used um, between me and some friends of mine. Um, what we did is any ladies that I'd recruited were then advertised on his website. And the ladies on his website were advertised on mine. And the agency just grew, you know, organically from approximately five ladies in the first month all the way to 20 in the second. I'm shaking my head like this because he's like he's applying a lot of business models into into this right now, even though it's like not legal. Like it's a it's a like if you really like take a step back from your emotions and and and, and your uh and your morals and just look like and listen like he's business savvy out here. The girl. Now keep in mind, I do not condone it for that quick and fast. Yeah. And bearing in mind, in 2008, there was a lot less competition. And so, how much would you make off one girl? Um, you could say typically it would be four or five bookings a week. So, 300 pounds? A week off of one girl? Off one, yeah. Dang. And he had five, he said, in the beginning? Five times five? Hey, Siri! What's five times 30? I mean, wait, scratch that. Start over. Five times 30 is 150. What's five times 300? 1,500 a week. What's 1,500 times four? 6,000. 6,000 a month? That's tough. Hey Siri, what's 6,000 times 12? 6,000 times 12 is 72,000. Not saying that I condone it, Siri, I'm just asking. Anyway. And this was in month two. Did you ever have a, a, a kickback from the girls saying, I guess, I, I no longer want to do this and that they like, had to continue to do this? The main kickback you'll get is if you don't provide the work. If you don't provide them with adequate bookings, they'll easily just pick up the phone and say, listen, remove my pictures of your site. That's it. Our relationship is over. Sometimes that will be the case. Sometimes they'll give you an a reason for it. Sometimes they won't. I mean, at the end of the day, it's their prerogative, yeah? All you can do is you can do your absolute best because at the end of the day, if I'm making money, she's making money. If she's making money, I am making money. Otherwise, if the bookings come to a standstill, yeah, the relationship isn't working. Um, at the peak of your agency, how many girls did you have working for you? For, uh, just under 30. Just under. He said 30 or 13? For, uh, just under 30. Just under 30. Afterwards, it became more of a quantity. No, sorry, quality of a quantity. <laughs> And when you had 30 girls working for you, how much was you making a week then? Good question. At my peak, in terms of profit, about 17 to 18,000 pounds a month in profit. A month? 
Hey Siri, what's 18,000 times 12? 216,000. And that is my after deducting all the costs. And how would you feel morally about, Net. I guess, selling other people's bodies and you're making 18 grand a month on the back of that? How would you, how, did you feel any way about that? You can ask how I felt at the time, and at the time I felt, to be honest, if I'm making 5,000 pounds as a lady, she's earning 10. Um, so that was actually my justification at the time. If you ask, you know, with a little bit more maturity and understanding how do I feel, yeah, they should be keeping all of it. There should be adequate tools out there for them to be able to work safely without the need of a middleman. And what's the difference between you running an agency and a pimp? Ah, hey, hey, hey. It, the question just ran past my head again. He talking about middleman. Like, bro, you out here pimping. I get it. You don't want to be called that. It's a, it's a, it's a taboo to be called that. But th that's what you're doing. <laughs> To my understanding, um, and from the research I did, you know, a pimp provides accommodation, food, um, drugs, and security. But there's not actually any earnings involved. The earnings go all to the pimp. You know, we don't get involved in a life like that. We pass on a booking and then we don't see or hear from them. Um, they take a break. We don't, we don't have any contact. Sometimes they might become friends. But just be a working relationship most of the time. So that's why I like to distinguish an escort agency over a classic pimp. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't any evil escort agencies. Of course there is. But it's just not the way I operate it. You know what I just heard? He's a hybrid. He's a hybrid pimp. <laughs> that's all. And then going back to your story, um, obviously, I know you wish to remain anonymous, um, but obviously, as I was reading your story, I was reading harrowing things about the, the story itself, like girls were forced into working, they wanted to return home, they couldn't. Uh, what, what's your side of events there? The press is the press. You know, the press need to make a story as compelling as possible. Um, you know, I could just easily do the same in front of the camera. Um, but I believe I'm choosing to be honest. Um, however, there's been more than enough evidence that the press isn't as honest as they could be. I think the face of media is changing. And I think people get to, get to see another perspective, whereas before they would have seen something on the mainstream and that's it. You know, they would have had to believe that. And what was the youngest girl you had working for you? 19 years old. How do you feel about that? Yeah, she was a university student. Um, initially, I wasn't on board. After some persistence from her side, you know, I gave her a go. It didn't last long, though. She was nowhere near mature enough. I find that anyone under the age of 30 is very, very difficult for a lady to do this job. You know, there's certain mental maturity that is developed through life experience. And unless that came at you at a really young age. I believe most ladies working the escorts are 30 plus. Wow, under 30? I mean, over 30? Um, and I guess, did you have any, what, what would be the situation if, I guess, the client had uh, some altercation with one of your girls, what would happen there? So I had security. It was a rare occurrence. This is part of my job. That no, that's a fact. Like, not, it's, it's, he has security. He had, like, he was a hybrid pimp. It was like a two thousand new age type. The client is initially why I'm being paid the commission. Um, I'll, I will take measures for that. And in the rare cases that something does happen, or there is a booking late at night, or by request of the lady, I could send someone to her apartment. Whether just after the incident takes place or even just to wait behind the scenes, you know, just as a safety precaution. You know, I think that gave them peace of mind. Cl 
client never knew that there was someone else there. And I guess, how did your world come crumbling down? Oh, he got caught? The problem is, running an escort agency is legal. Um, working as an escort is legal. Controlling prostitution is illegal. It's a, very, it's a legal gray area where all of a sudden, if I'm no longer an escort agency, but I'm actually facilitating prostitution, which essentially that's what an escort agency does. But it just takes, you know, one complaint to say that, you know what, I'm not an escort, I'm a prostitute. And ABC is facilitating my work. And that's enough for the authorities to investigate. And I guess when they did the investigation, <coughs> like, so you telling me one of the girls that was that was involved in which what, what you had going on told somebody that you that they was a pro instead of that. so the the word pro and escort got you in trouble the differentiation the dif the difference between those two words got you in trouble. How was your court, should I say? Was there a case of a girl went to the police, a uh, client went to the police, those just had surveillance on you? So how, how did they actually find out you was doing what you was doing? Two ladies went to the police. Dang. Um, we had a range of nationalities working on our website. <clears throat> I also found that it's very rare for the authorities to do anything if the ladies are from the European Union at the time, because they're legal right to live and work, you know, in the UK. It That's messed up. So they was, they was potentially targeting certain women that were, that were a part or weren't a part? Uh, for the authorities to do anything if the ladies are from the European Union at the time. Wow. Because they're legal right to live and work, you know, in the UK. It's when they are from outside the EU, when the authorities look, okay, if someone's staying in the country illegally, they're not paying the tax. You know, if there, is there any coercion control? Is oh, it okay. So if you're from outside of the European Union, that's when they're looking at you harder because taxes and whatnot. So, so if it's not benefiting the government, <laughs> they come for you. Yeah, you know, a bigger picture behind it. In my case, there was a bigger picture, past the escort agency. Um, something that I wasn't directly involved in, but I was naive and maybe ignorant to that fact. At the end of the day, if two ladies go to the police, you know, that means they're obviously not making it up because that will be one. You know, the, it is the authorities job to investigate at that point. And that's the beginning of, you could say the end of, the, end of my career in this. So why did the girls go to the police? I think they were seduced with an idea. And the idea being receiving legal status to remain in the UK. I genuinely believe the authorities just needed to tick some boxes, that they're doing something every once in a while. And they approached some of the ladies on my agencies and also the competition with a promise that, look, we, we know what's going on. You know, if you cooperate, you know, we would actually legitimize your, legitimize your visa because they were staying, in fact, illegally. Um, I believe this was the main motivation. That'll do it. For going to the police. But what was their justification? So I guess they couldn't say that to the police. So what, what would they say to the police? They, they relayed the story accurately. I'm not saying that they lied. Um, they didn't lie. Well, but it's just perhaps they wouldn't have not disclose that information if they hadn't been promised an incentive. They killing me with this. He's really killing me with the mask. Like, I'm like, his eyes are telling 
giving me a range of emotions. I can I can tell what his face is doing with his whole with his eye. You know, they were quite happily happy to make X amount of money every month. Question. Why did you recruit women from abroad opposed to having girls work for your agency from England? I forgot to turn my ad block on, my fault. We have an agency. We, once the agency is established, we don't go out there actively recruiting. They contact us. Um, it's as simple as that. The easiest explanation I can give you is there are fewer British ladies working as escorts in London, but also they might be more capable of working independently. They might have the adequate skills required to, you know, speak to their customers, vet them, market themselves, promote themselves, you know, answer the telephone. Use Instagram, use Twitter. <laughs> Pause. And also, they might feel more safe and secure, you know, taking that risk personally, rather than entrusting someone else. And as well, running agencies, do you ever get any shocking requests from clients? Yeah. Um, th th there's, a, there's a long list. What would you say, one that you probably won't forget? Um, I did have a regular who enjoyed being beaten up by women half the size. Uh, he was almost seven foot tall. Damn! Um, weighed like 130 kilograms. <laughs> hey Siri, what's 130 kilograms in pounds? 300 pounds almost, that's seven feet. That's kind of skinny for a seven footer. But, but. But yeah, he's, he, 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 he seemed to enjoy his... Uh, half his half his weight? <laughs> 150? And he would often stay until 3, 4 a.m. And head straight to work. First thing in the morning. Who was your best girl? Uh, oh, profit-wise, and, and why do you think that would have been? My best lady was... Her stage name was Carmen. Come. The reason why she was so popular is she had incredible, incredible acting skills. Oh. And this was one person where, you know, the punter genuinely felt that they had a connection with her. You know, she wasn't necessarily the prettiest. She was out there turning tricks. That's crazy. She was actually getting people to fall in love. You know, lady out there. Telling them what they wanted to hear. She didn't necessarily provide the broadest range of services, but she could connect with the punter, and that's honestly the most important thing. Um, it's just the way how you make the punter feel. Um, the punter? A lot of people assume that the punter is going in there to pay for sex. More often than not, he's going there just to have someone to talk to. And if he doesn't have that connection with the lady, Yes, he might visit her once, but he will not visit her re repeatedly. Why not go see a psychiatrist? And that's essentially what makes someone a tough owner. And then when the police got involved and you was, I guess, charged, um, what was the conclusion? Did you end up in prison? I went to prison for three years. Um, it was after a lengthy case in court. Um, it was really big at the time. And yeah, it was a massive, massive experience. Look, looking back, do you regret it? Of course. Of course, of he course. looked like he regretted. Um, I don't think, unless you're defending your friends or family, or your loved ones, that's the only reason to go to prison. The motivation of making money is not a reason to go to prison. Being violent, controlling, abusive, they're not reasons to go to prison. The only justification I have now in my life is if I was defending a loved one, and it was absolutely the last resort. 
this is the only advice I can give to people. That's crazy, because if I'm defending the love on my first, my absolute first resort <laughs> is violence. Me personally, because I'm also in the United States and I'm in Florida. So it's way different in Florida than it is in Chicago. Like you have like all intensive rights to defend anything about your space. You know what I'm saying? Like they got that stand your ground rule. Um, now in Florida, starting May, June, I think July 1st, you don't have to have no training. I'm talking about this much. Zero training, no license, and you can walk around with a concealed weapon. Um, it's, it's, it's real crazy. It we'll gets spooky out here. You got to remember, uh, Florida is a red state, so don't, don't play with it. Think what you're actually going to prison for. You know, not that you might end up in prison. Like, you wouldn't even go to prison... Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you too. We don't condone that type of behavior. I'm just saying, allegedly. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, and plus, like, our, our rules aren't like that in the UK. Like, you're not going to go to jail. <laughs> it's self-defense, period. Uh, and that's it. That should hopefully be enough to sway you from any rash decisions. However, sometimes in life. A red state, you know, you got Democrats and Republicans... Um, the more traditional, I would say red states are Republican, right? I think it's Republican. And they're pro-gun, pro-everything. Pro you have to experience something to learn that lesson. And that was the case for me. Pro-constitution. Uh, and I guess when you was in prison, um, what was your life like then? Um, initially difficult, as I imagine it would be for most people. However, the one thing about human, humans is we always adapt to the situation we're in. And this is why I believe extending someone's sentence or just handing out longer sentences is not the way forward. Because eventually that person will adapt to his environment and it will become not easy, but easier. Is that the best way for someone to learn the lesson or to improve their life afterwards? Yeah, he right as hell. Giving me a lengthy extended prison time. I, you, that's always what that is, though, man. You got to want to change to change. That's This is period. I'm not too sure. And touching back, um, I guess, when you was running the agency again, um, was there ever times where girls were forced to work? How do you get your yard to look this good? Oh, you need to get paint it. My, the main answer is no, but yeah, if, if you really think about it, there were circumstances where they could have felt forced to work. And that's the wording I'll use. You know, it's not a case of saying, you know, you're working, end of story, there's no arguments. It's more so that they feel obliged you know, they feel slightly um, guilty to not work. For example, if they have a regular punter who visits them every week and then one particular day they're tired, you know, they might think, if I don't work this job, you know, he might not visit me again. You know, it might disappoint him. That's one example of they could feel forced to work. Uh, another example is providing certain services. You know, you might think they were never told you have to do this. But also they'll think, if I don't do it, I might earn less or I might become less popular with age. Loki, he wording stuff in such a way to make him not feel as bad as he really do. Like, he, he, he's already stated that, like, morally he feels bad, he regrets it all, but, like, you can tell the way he's wording it. He's trying to make himself not sound as bad as it, what it was. Agency will send less work my way. Recommend me less. I, I guess another reason why I... It might be Andrew Tate up under there. You don't ever know who that is. The question was, in the articles which I was reading about the case, um, I came across uh, one of them where they said their passports were taken 
Damn. Yeah, so this is common, but there's no reason for an agency to take a passport. But where this distinction is, is how the lady arrived into the UK in the first place. You know, who is responsible for that? And um, if I'm running an agency... I get what he's saying, but damn, I still both. Agency full time. I don't think I could take that on, you know. The skill set required for that is much greater than running an escort agency. That person. So I guess when you, they've been flown in. They had to edit that out. Who's paying for that and... Who's paying for that and... Again, it will be the person that facilitated the arrival into the UK, you know, and that wouldn't be one person. It would be, you know, an agent abroad with perhaps financial backer here. And, that and well, so... Let's they had to edit that out. Say they work for you. Yeah. Would they have to pay you back that flight fee before they make anything? Before they make anything? No, they would pay me my commission, but they perhaps would also pay you know, the person that facilitated their arrival. And hey, they're asking too many questions that's hitting home, man. You got to get up out of there. The UK. I'll give you an example. If a lady's turnover was 15,000, they paid four and a half as in 30% commission, they might then pay another four and a half you know, to the person that facilitated the arrival into the UK. Yeah. But it's not something... It's like a label deal. That studio time ain't free. That transportation wasn't free is what he's saying. I'm not saying that. That's what he's saying. I think I was directly involved in. But again, I was ignorant and naive and perhaps just turned a blind eye thinking of my own benefit. Yeah, there's overheads there. TLO, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. This is a crazy one. I ain't even gonna lie to you. It was very educational, informative. And I've learned a lot, YouTube, because that's what I'm here for, to educate myself. Thank you.